president is leaving the safety of the White House, as he does several times a week and hundreds of times a year. But a presidential trip is never routine. Any visit outside the White House requires hundreds of people, thousands of hours, and enough communication and security equipment to outfit an army. Since the president travels constantly, the Secret Service is always a step ahead, preparing what they call advancing several sites at a time. This team is advancing Baton Rouge, while other teams are on the ground advancing sites in Texas, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Everywhere the president goes, the security bubble goes too. Every trip the president makes is a challenge. And for us, it's, um, it's game day every time he leaves the White House property. It's our Super Bowl. The Secret Service has five days to secure this site, the arena at Louisiana State University, where President Bush will deliver the commencement address. For the advanced team, it's a challenging site to control, with over 14,000 seats and more than 100 entrances. The protective measures start at the arena, but will expand outwards to include the university and even hundreds of miles beyond the city of Baton Rouge. The preparation is mind-boggling. The security advance begins here with Kim Tate, special agent in charge of the New Orleans field office. The key to success at any location is working hand-in-hand -hand with the state and local police. Many agents started as cops, so they speak the same language. Good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm pleased to find myself in a room filled with seasoned professionals. I'm Kim Tate. They discuss every aspect of the trip, assess every danger. Has anyone in the area threatened the president? Have gun sales surged? Have any police uniforms been stolen? To prevent an attack, they have to get inside the heads of the attackers. So I have a map here. Uh, what I want to talk about right now uh, while we're all here is the uh, motorcade route coming from the airport. The team maps out the most secure route for the motorcade. Out to uh, Veterans Boulevard brings us to Hardy. Identifies potential sniper positions, pinpoints safe houses along the way, locates the nearest hospitals, and arranges for the president to have his own blood supply. From here, Nothing will be left to chance. As you prepare your security advance this week and on game day, when you put that plan into action, keep this in mind. Somewhere, a group of people are meeting just like we are, but their intentions are entirely different than ours. They plan to disrupt, to compromise the secure environment that we provide for the president. I like to call it the, the assassin's funnel. You know, you have the, the lone gunman. You have suicide bombers to deal with. It can be a bomb. It can be a package. We have an obligation to try to think ahead, to try to find the things that they might attack next and try to be ahead of the curve. When your mission is to protect the president, you don't underestimate the enemy. Protect the man, protect the symbol, protect the office. This is the mandate of the U.S. Secret Service. A purposely unmarked building in downtown Washington, D.C. is the nerve center for thousands in the Secret Service who work in domestic and international operations. This is the headquarters of the Secret Service. The enormous responsibilities for the agency ultimately lie on the shoulders of this man, the director of the Secret Service, Ralph Basham. As a career agent who rose through the ranks, Basham knows the mission here boils down to one thing. How's everyone today? Preparation. We're going to talk about the Baton Rouge trip. If you think about our mission, it's about prevention. We don't want to deal uh, after the fact with an incident. We want to prevent the incident from happening, so that's why so much time and so much effort, so many resources go into the preparation for those kinds of events. Not many people know what the Secret Service does, and that's exactly how they like it. The image of the agent guarding the president is ingrained in our minds. 
but the Secret Service does a lot more than protect. Deep inside headquarters are some of the nation's top investigative and research units. The National Threat Assessment Center, the Intelligence Division, the Counterfeit Research Unit, the Electronic Crime Branch, and a tracking center for Secret Service protectees, including former presidents, presidential candidates, and visiting dignitaries. And then there's a room that hums with information so sensitive that its location can never be revealed. The Joint Operations Center. This is where the Secret Service tracks the movements of the president, the first family, and the vice president, and where the most important residence in the United States is under constant surveillance. Every entrance, every approach, even the air around the White House is monitored 24 hours a day. To maintain secrecy in radio communications, the primary protectees are assigned a code name. In the past, President Bush was known as Tumblr and Trailblazer. But as soon as the media learns the code, it changes. Uh, they say in the Secret Service, unless you're paranoid, you're usually not successful. There are regular, daily, ongoing threats uh, of a president. That threat always looms. It doesn't go away. The chilling fact is that someone has always wanted to kill the president. In 1835, President Andrew Jackson's life was spared when shots from a madman's guns misfired. Abraham Lincoln was shot and killed at a theater. James Garfield was killed by an insane man at a train station. Despite the attacks, Americans were reluctant to authorize protection. The very idea of a presidential guard reeked of monarchy and seemed undemocratic. But at the turn of the century, shortly after President William McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist, Congress finally charged the Secret Service with presidential protection. Even then, their authorization had to be renewed annually. Fifty years later, a brutal gun battle in front of the president's house settled the question of permanent protection once and for all. The year is 1950, a time when anyone could stroll down Pennsylvania Avenue, even the president of the United States. November 1st, the White House is still under renovation and President Truman is living across the street at Blair House. Standing guard outside the president's front door is Secret Service agent Floyd Boring. Truman was upstairs taking a nap. Every day at, uh, after lunch, he napped. And then he got up, got himself ready to go back to work. 2.15 p.m. Two men approach the front steps. Oscar Callazo, a Puerto Rican nationalist, approaches from the east. Griselio Torsola approaches from the west. A man came to the front of, his, of the Blair House, and he pulled out a gun. Boring opens fire, driving him away from the front door. At the same moment, the second assailant opens fire at the guardhouse, hitting Secret Service Private Leslie Kofelt. Kofelt, badly wounded, struggles to his feet, takes aim, and shoots the second assailant. Torcello had been shot through the ears. Right one ear out the other, he died right on the spot. 27 shots were fired during the violent gun battle. Three hit Leslie Kofelt. He died later that night, the first Secret Service officer to be killed by an assassin. Outraged by the brazen daylight attack, Congress sent President Truman a bill that would give him permanent protection. Pen in hand, he said, it's wonderful to know that the work of protecting me has, at last, become legal. The bloody shootout meant that the days of an easily accessible president were gone. The threat of violence would force him to step away from the people who had elected him, toward the well-armed safety of the agents. It's T-minus four, four days until the president arrives. 
The Secret Service advance team sets up a command center in an undisclosed hotel suite. The room is completely transformed. The beds are removed. Secure phones are brought in. There will be no room service, and the room will not be cleaned. We'll just play with it. Right. You can okay. make almost. Uh, we'll tweak it. Thank you. We're gonna have 5,200 people coming in. I'll just ask for all the information to be finalized for tomorrow. The site where the president will give his speech is a vast arena. Site advance agent Lawrence Tucker and supervisor Tom McCarthy go over the security plans. We're looking at uh, approximately between 13 and 14,000 people uh, okay. in here on the ground level and on uh, up. Only through the eyes of a Secret Service agent can an empty arena seem so ominous. A monster at 74,000 square feet. Where could the threat come from? So where is that? Assailants could slip in through any of the 130 entrances, pose as a graduate in any of the 14,000 seats. So the mags are going to be set up on the far end? The, the mags will be set up on this end, sir. A sniper could hide in the catwalks above or in air ducts in the floor below. Five or six what about on uh, top and two on a catwalk? Potted plants could conceal bombs. So could seat pads on the 850 chairs on the floor. The task is daunting. Sounds good. This is a, a pretty uh, huge undertaking. You're going to have, you know, over 13,000 people in this venue. Especially for a venue this size, you got to make sure that the whole outer perimeter is taken care of. Everybody has to be on the same uh, sheet of music. Agent Lawrence Tucker, or LT, must do everything in his power to ensure that this arena doesn't become the place where the president is attacked. LT is a member of the Presidential Protective Division, or PPD, a group of agents who have risen through the ranks and earned the assignment to protect the president. They stand at the president's shoulder. They are the shield. It's an honor, but a potentially deadly one. The area around the president is known in the business as the kill zone. To thwart an assassin, LT must think like an assassin. From the adjoining building, he and his team can get an aerial look at the arena and see where their plan is vulnerable. We'll have someone just the other side of this tower watching those stairs that are coming down. Right. And then we'll have someone watching that loading dock plus the two on the buildings that'll be able to see the whole area right there. That'll secure the arrival location pretty good. And okay. Fine with me? Okay. Good. Back at the command center, LT pinpoints and eliminates site threats. But protecting the president is far bigger than securing any one event. In Washington, a global threat analysis is always underway. This is the threat of the president's wife. He's dead, okay? I want to blow up the White House and the Capitol building. At headquarters, specialists assess the constant stream of threats made against the president. The Secret Service won't say how many threats are made, only that every threat is investigated. Yes, if I'm woken up, if I'm woken up at 3.30 in the morning again, I'll assassinate President Clinton. These recordings usually come from the agency's intelligence division, collected from calls into the White House, local police, and radio and television stations. Well, most of the time the recordings come in, um, there, there's a lot of noise on it. So first we try and remove the noise as much as possible without damaging the voice. And I'm going to blow up the president and I'm going to kill him. So you guys can like have a fun time there because like, we're, we're going to kill him. Schwartz listens for features in the caller's voice, accent, dialect, or speech defects. We're going to kill him. Any nuance that may help to set the voice apart and identify it. I want to blow it up the White House and the Capitol building. Who is threatening the president? He's dead, okay? The answer is never simple. History has shown us that assassins come in all shapes and forms. We've had them from, uh, from young men all the way to uh, uh, women that were grandmothers who have actually made attempts to assassinate uh, our protectees. So every threat is taken very seriously. Agents are also trained to distinguish between those that make threats and those who can carry them out. So you 
uniformed officers. We now teach our agents, look at how someone's organized or not. Do they have the capacity to travel? Do they have the capacity to obtain weapons? We'll go through the questions several times. Keep your feet flat on the floor, eyes straight ahead. If an agent thinks someone is dangerous, they may bring them in for questioning. Did you write any of those threatening letters? No. Did you plan with anybody to kill the President of the United States? No. Virtually every letter contains some traceable clue. We refer to ourselves uh, as uh, CSI without the commercials. It's almost impossible to threaten the President in a letter and remain anonymous. Through an amazing array of techniques, the Secret Service will eventually hunt you down. The Forensic Information System for Handwriting, or FISH, is a database filled with thousands of threat letters. Each time a new letter comes in, it's scanned, analyzed, and compared with other letters to try and identify repeat offenders. We received this threatening letter from the field, and it was a threat against President. Right now, Jacqueline is measuring it in FISH to compare it to all the other letters that we have in our FISH system. The same letter will also be subjected to an intense fingerprint scan. Once a print is imported from the threat letter, a database searches the millions of prints to find the best matches. Fingerprints, palm prints, and even foot and toe prints. Even the ink and the paper can be traced. The Secret Service has the largest collection of inks in the world, nearly 8,000, dating from the turn of the century and collected from around the world. Chemical analysis of the paper can reveal how it was processed, even the kind of trees used to make it. This is the end of the line for the threat letter. Here, the procedure will ultimately destroy the evidence. The letter is put into a chemical bath, which reveals remnants of the author's DNA. The residue will turn a purplish color. Latent fingerprints and any grease or oils are now exposed. The clues gleaned from all the labs are combined to create a profile of a potential suspect. We may not get a match in terms of a, an identity, but we're able to say that the letter written in, in Boston uh, two years ago matches the one uh, written in Phoenix uh, that we just got in. So we know we have the same person appearing, and that's a great investigative lead for us. Eminent threats are quickly relayed to field agents, like the team in Louisiana. Here, there are just three days to go before the president arrives. They've scouted the site. Now they refine their plan. Good evening, everybody. Let's uh, get this done. We have three days out before game day. Everybody should know where they need to be. Just remember all your paperwork and uh, everything that needs to be turned in. Uh, we're going to go over some uh, administrative stuff now, and then uh, we'll uh, key in on the technical stuff. No one has ever been privy to the security plans of the Secret Service, and no one ever will. Protecting the president has always been difficult. In 2001, events conspired to dramatically increase the danger. September 11th started uh, as a, a pretty routine day for me. I got in about 7 o'clock, and I got a call from the duty desk, and they were briefing me that we were getting intelligence that there was a potential hijacking. So we activated the crisis center. Deep inside headquarters in a top secret room, managers and directors began to assess the nature of the hijacking. The first plane um, hit, I believe, the North Towers um, of the World Trade Center at about 8.45. I thought and hoped that it was an accident, uh, but when the second one hit, uh, uh, we knew that it wasn't. To some agents, it seemed that someone was trying to decapitate the U.S. government. We activated our continuity of government plan, and we uh, deployed agents to uh, locate and uh, remain with anyone in the line of succession. Secret Service protection now extended to the Speaker of the House, the President pro tempore of the Senate, and the Secretary of State. One of the first things we do, obviously, is to locate uh, all of our protectees from the President on down not only for the president and the vice president, but for their families, for former presidents, for foreign dignitaries or heads of state who may be in this country. What's important for us is that 
we have a plan. If you don't have a plan, the game's over before you begin. In a state of emergency, the Secret Service's plan is to get every protectee to a secure site. We got calls that uh, there appeared to be a plane headed for the White House, and we had immediately called the vice president's detail. There was no time for chit-chat, no time for, you know, will you come with us? I mean, they just took him. Vice President Cheney said, my feet never touched the floor. Meanwhile, the president wanted to get back to Washington. We agreed that coming back to Washington was not a good decision. So there was discussion uh, on Air Force One between the agent in charge, the uh, president, the vice president, the director of the Secret Service was involved in several conversations, and the national security advisor as to what actions would take place. With Washington and New York in a state of chaos, the Secret Service put the president aboard Air Force One, the one place where they controlled all the variables. There was a very deliberate mood in here. There was a lot of determination and focus on the part of everyone in here to do their job, something that we had trained for and planned for, but had hoped would never happen. And we were watching on television as uh, the towers collapsed. As headquarters watched the horror unfold, agents in the New York field office, directly across the street from the towers, were experiencing it firsthand. We moved out onto the West Side Highway, where uh, I'm absolutely proud to say uh, agents of the Secret Service were conducting triage. We had uh, a lot of injured workers there, broken legs, torn flesh, gaping wounds, and you know we went right into mode of treating these people. I just felt it was amazing how, no matter where you were in the city as an agent, um, somehow there was another agent that you ran into. I think a part of our training was to expect a diversion, expect multiple attacks. And uh, in the back of our minds, I think a lot of us were kind of on the, uh, watching and thinking, what else should we expect? I remember thinking myself looking at trucks suspiciously, like, what will the next attack be? I was absolutely just livid. I was so mad. Uh, when that second tower came down and we crawled, crawled out from underneath the uh, car, um, I was so mad. You knew what it was at that point. You had clear understanding we were under attack. One officer's heroic efforts to rescue other people cost him his life. Craig Miller died in the chaos. That was probably the most uh difficult time we had. There were a lot of questions everybody had and, and we didn't have answers to. Well, I think since 9-11, the Secret Service may be more careful about the president even than before. The Secret Service emerged from 9-11 confronting an inescapable truth. Terrorism had redefined the threat spectrum. It's probably changed the stress level by twofold. The very violent and random attacks that are brought on by terrorism are, are, are something that the Secret Service is extremely concerned about. We all did it, and we did it after swallowing our, our personal horror of the tragic events of that day um, in, in a fleeting moment and, and getting on about fulfilling the mission that, that we in the Secret Service uh, are, are tasked with doing. The presidential motorcade is on the move. A trip to an event in town. They've driven the route hundreds of times. The bubble advances through familiar territory. But familiar never means risk-free. Welcome to Beltsville, Maryland, training grounds for the Secret Service. Here, agents and officers learn to handle disasters by experiencing them again and again. 
Car bombs, snipers, gas and chemical attacks. A chilling variety of assassination attempts are launched against the agents in training. There may be instincts that all of us are born with to, to move away from danger versus moving toward it. One of the things that the Secret Service does through its training programs is, is take that out of you. You're hearing shots go off, shots be fired, and you're still responding to the problem, not running away from it. Thick forest surrounds the Beltsville compound, making it invisible from the road. But inside, it feels and sounds like a Hollywood backlot. There's a tactical village with a main street and building facades to scale and half of Air Force One. This is where Secret Service agents come to prepare mentally and physically for the worst. Okay, guys, obviously we've given you the worst case scenarios in our training here today. Hopefully you'll be able to respond without thinking, so in the real world, if the extreme happens, you'll be able to do it and be successful. It's a type of agency that takes a, perhaps a type A personality, type A squared. They are mostly very measured people, very under control of their emotions at, at times of stress. Smart, very meticulous planners. Through training, through a mindset, through a conditioning, be prepared to step up when the time comes. The culture is not the biggest and the strongest that come to the table. It's the swiftest and the smartest that come to the table. Every agent learns how to take down a potential assassin, how to fall out of a moving car, to treat for shock and for bullet wounds. They endlessly repeat hundreds of maneuvers to create a Pavlovian response, a muscle memory, the right reaction to a situation the agents hope will never happen. It's not a, let me stop and think about this for a minute, uh, and then make a decision. It is a reaction that comes from just the constant, repetitive training. Some agents go through an intensive, evasive driving course, a key part of protecting the president. In a worst case scenario, you know, if the motorcade was attacked, it's all really about, you know, protecting the main guy. These agents are practicing the J-turn, a tire screeching pivot with a tight stop and an immediate change in direction. With these turns, we can approach speeds of 60, 70 miles an hour. They practice in Camaros, but they'll use their skills on the real thing, suburbans and limos that weigh much more. Well, they call me Super Dave. They, they think I'm a little crazy out here. I like to go as fast as the car can go all the time. And I'll be the guy that experiments. Like, if they want to experiment with something, I'm all for trying it. Closing straight up, two hands on the weapon. For agents who work closest to a protectee, training is even more intense and demanding. Their standard weapon is a 357 semi-automatic pistol. Other weapons of choice include the M16 and the MP5 submachine gun. The Secret Service requires each agent to qualify with a firearm every month. Because they may be called upon to open fire in a crowd or from a moving vehicle, agents must learn rapid, accurate firing and the training never stops. Agents on presidential details must return to sharpen their skills two weeks out of every eight. Worthy of trust and confidence, commitment and dedication, attention to detail, and that is instilled from the first day that an agent uh, becomes a member of the organization. You plan for the unexpected because you, know, you only get one shot. Either, either you're trusted or you're not. In a basement garage in New York, a different kind of training is underway. These agents are preparing not to protect the president, but to protect the lifeblood of our economy, the U.S. currency. There's a good possibility that we encounter these two guys today that they're packing as well. Everybody wear your vest. Vests are not an option, right? Two weeks ago, 
agents in the New York office broke up a ring of Eastern European counterfeiters. Today, the Secret Service squad is heading out to recreate the bust for training purposes. Most people don't know that more than half of the entire Secret Service staff is dedicated to investigating counterfeit currency and electronic fraud. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the public doesn't really know what we do. I think they, uh, they're under uh, the premise that we all fly around in capes and that we're bulletproof and that we're part of some secret association with a secret handshake. When you think of the Secret Service, you think of protecting the president and the vice president, and, and no one realizes that, uh, that we do a lot more. The Secret Service was created in 1865 to stop counterfeiters. At the end of the Civil War, counterfeit money was so rampant that it posed a serious threat to the nation's banking system. As much as one half of the nation's money supply was fake. The Secret Service's mission was to restore public confidence in the country's money. The work was considered so sensitive, the identity of the agents was kept completely secret, and a name with an instant mystique was born. Almost 140 years later, the Secret Service is still on the case. broke through the door two weeks ago, the counterfeiters had left the site and the cash. Oh yeah, that's the money. It's like we got it. There it is. Get some more pictures of us. If they hadn't been busted, half a million dollars, all fake paper, could have made it to the street. Money, money, yeah. very nice, very nice. The field agents send the suspect money back to the lab in Washington where specialists will carefully scrutinize every bill. Counterfeit specialist Lorelei Pagano is an expert at identifying bogus money. Everything comes to us as suspect. To confirm that it's fake, Pagano first checks security features embedded in the paper, the printing, the ink. If you examine the counterfeit that's just come in, you hold up some light, you can see that there is an image of Franklin and that there is a thread. However, if you look at it through a light table, you can actually see that there's a commercial watermark, and it says recycled. So right away, you would know that that's counterfeit. Another trick is to change the denomination of a bill so that a 10 becomes a 100. But the counterfeiter basically just eradicated all of the areas where it said $10, and then changed them by hand and raised the denomination to 100. This, I would think, was not worth the $90 that he profited from. To outpace counterfeiters, the government issues new bills every five to seven years. But with high-tech scanners and printers, counterfeiters are forging more money faster. We used to average less than 100 domestic counterfeiting operations, and now we're over 600 in any given year. Today, the best counterfeit money is printed with old-fashioned presses by sophisticated drug and terrorist rings. Millions of dollars of fake money is used to finance illegal arms trading, drug trafficking, bribery, and terrorism. The U.S. dollar is vital to these criminal efforts. To protect it, the Secret Service has to stay one step ahead. Obviously, there are things that every government has to keep a secret so that the counterfeiters don't know about it and they don't know what they need to be attacking. So that's just good banknote design. Some things we just don't tell. In an undisclosed location, 
Agent Ken Valentine cleans and polishes the President's car. This James Bond invention is affectionately known as the Beast. I'll tell you that the car has two limitations as far as we're concerned. It doesn't fly and it doesn't float. The agents protect information about the car with the same tenacity that they protect the President. How thick are the doors on the car? The thickness of the doors is a matter that we're not prepared to discuss. What kind of armor does it have? Well, I'll tell you, the armor is state-of-the-art, but beyond that, I'm not at liberty to discuss the armor or the capabilities of the armor. Is it bomb-proof? Is it bulletproof? It's very capable. What kind of security measures are there in the car? I I'm not at liberty to discuss the security measures uh, other than to say that it's a very capable vehicle. The details of the beast may be classified, but like other armored cars, it probably features a remote starter with bomb detector, a self-healing fuel tank, supplemental oxygen, and wheel inserts that allow the limo to drive even when the tires are shot out. One thing is clear. Any car with windows as thick as phone books and doors that weigh hundreds of pounds is not like any other car in the world. But the beast is more than an armored car. It is the response to a nightmare, an event that shook the world and changed the Secret Service forever. President Kennedy loved people, loved to be around people. We had gone from President Eisenhower, who was a retired general, to a former senator who was uh, very free and, and, and wanted to do things that we were not used to having him do. We went from the hotel to the airport and flew from Fort Worth to Dallas in Air Force One. And uh, there was a large crowd at the airport in Dallas. November 1963, President and Mrs. Kennedy are in Texas to rally support for the next presidential election. Their two-day trip includes a motorcade through Dallas. Clint Hill is assigned to protect Mrs. Kennedy. He is stationed on the runners of the follow-up car, directly behind the presidential limousine. Along the way, there were large crowds. We stopped a couple times to permit the people to shake hands with the president. When we got into the central part of Dallas, the crowds were larger. As we proceeded down through the center of Dallas, on occasion, I would move from the follow-up car up to the back of the presidential limousine. Shortly after we got into that turn and started on that street, I heard a sound. I turned to see what was happening. I knew something was wrong. I saw President Kennedy grab at his throat. Before I could get to the presidential limousine, another shot had been fired and hit President Kennedy in the head. About that time, I reached the back of the limousine and tried to get on. I had to run three or four more steps before I could get up. By that time, Mrs. Kennedy had come out onto the trunk and was seeing, it appeared to me to be searching for something or trying to retrieve something. But I got up on the back of the car and placed her back in the seat. The president at that time has slipped down into her lap and I could see the back of his head and there was a gaping hole above his right ear, about the size of my palm and there was white brain matter and red blood throughout the entire car. We then, the car jolted forward and we sped off to Parkland Hospital.
as a stunned nation struggled with the enormous tragedy of a young president's murder. The Secret Service couldn't stop to mourn. They quickly moved to protect the new president. But the assassination shook the organization to its base and left the agents on the detail devastated. It was our responsibility to protect the president, and we failed to do so. Anytime that uh, you have a job to do and you don't do it, you've failed. The failure to protect Kennedy forced the Secret Service to ask difficult questions. Should the president be allowed to ride in an open car? Should motorcade routes be published in advance? And should those routes follow paths where the president could be an easy mark? Whatever the answers, things would never change for Clint Hill. It's something that will never go away. I still, still have nightmares about it. It bothered me from that point on, uh, and it got progressively worse. Eventually, that's the reason I retired, is that the doctors finally told me that you just can't go on. Unfortunately, that particular day, all the advantages went to the shooter. The assassination is still a defining moment, not only for the agency, but for every agent who has ever taken the oath. You don't think about your wife or your children or your own life. Your, your whole focus is to save the president. And I'm sure that's what went through Clint's head as he bolted for that, to that car, barely making it, but he got back there and it was too late. And uh, we're, we're all different from that. I mean, we're just different from having, having lived through it. If eternity has to remember me for something that was that tragic, I just couldn't live with myself. So, you know, my philosophy was it won't happen on my watch. It can't happen on my watch because I can't live with it. The assassination forced the Secret Service to rethink protection. Training was completely revamped. The number of agents jumped dramatically and the service developed state-of-the-art threat assessment abilities. Riding in an open car would become the rare exception to the rule. The car would become armored and sealed, a rolling fortress, the very embodiment of the protective bubble. The public persona of the U.S. president is that of an everyman. We see him leaving his house, waving before he goes off to work. He seems to do many of the things that we do. He doesn't rule from a palace or an ivory tower. He isn't surrounded by a presidential guard. He appears to move about freely. But he is only free within the bubble, and even there he is constantly covered. When the president crosses the White House lawn, Secret Service counter snipers are poised on the rooftops. The emergency response team is concealed in the bushes. The Secret Service's uniform division has a highly visible presence patrolling and guarding every access point. Together, these protective units maintain a nearly impenetrable cordon around the White House. Outside the White House, the risks increase. So do potential conflicts between White House staff and the Secret Service. Politics and protection are like oil and water. You really have to have a good blender in order to get it to work right. You know, if we had our way, we'd probably bring the president out once a year in a bulletproof capsule and show everybody that he's alive and then take him back near the White House. If the uh, staff had their way, he'd be out shaking hands with the public on a day-to-day -day basis. I've said this many times that uh, the Secret Service is, uh, is there to keep them safe, and that's not uh, always consistent with making them happy. There are times when you're with, with uh, a protectee where you have to tell them, you know, we're not going to go in this door, we're going to go over to this door. But later, he's probably going to tap you on the shoulder and go, why did we do that? 
And I would suggest that you have a pretty good answer. What happens when politics vies with protection? Negotiation. Larry Cockle led the presidential detail for Bill Clinton. He remarked once that of all the people that uh, he interacted with and of all the uh, authority and power of the president, that the Secret Service was the only uh, entity around him that would tell him no. So I don't think there was ever an instance where I overruled the president, but I found a way to make him see my point. Sometimes the agent simply has to make a dangerous situation work. The president, uh, he, he wanted to go to Bangladesh and Pakistan, uh, which for all intents and purposes would have been going into Al-Qaeda's backyard. I had to actually prepare to try to talk him out of going, but at the same time, I had to prepare to take him there in the event that he wasn't going to uh, take my advice. We went down to Cartagena when a lot of people were saying, don't go down there, the drugs, drug warlords are out of control at Cartagena in Colombia. And uh, I said, we got the Secret Service, I'm not going to worry about that. Now the president, more than any other time, is in a cocoon. The problem of a president being more and more isolated from mainstream America and from the way people live and the way they think is a problem that eventually we're going to come to regret in the sense that it went too far. It's hard to say that any measure to keep a president safe goes too far, but just think about it. It's a necessary evil to have 24-hour protection. It's a necessary evil to plan and, and meticulously orchestrate travel to ensure that nothing goes wrong. It's a high-stakes game. Preparation for that high-stakes game has reached a dramatic stage at the Baton Rouge airport. It's T minus two and counting, two days until the president arrives, and the invasion has begun. The Secret Service arrives in force. Two Air Force C-141 cargo planes packed with tons of equipment and enough manpower to staff a small army have landed. Inside, every imaginable security tool, metal detectors and communications equipment, canine bomb sniffers and their handlers, armored motorcade cars. Some of these cases may contain a variety of weapons, but the Secret Service will neither confirm nor deny this. And out of the belly of the plane comes the beast. Two of them, one for backup. The Secret Service team expands to include counter sniper and counter assault teams, technicians and support staff, drivers and spotters, doubling the number of agents and officers on the ground. Secret Service strategy is to meet any threat with overwhelming force. Prior to the arrival, the motorcade is going to stage in this general area over here. Supervising Agent Tom McCarthy begins to nail down the security plan at the airport location. The president's going to depart off the plane, uh, meet his greeters at the bottom of the steps. When we travel with the president around the world, we have to be sure that he is as safe anywhere in this country or anywhere in this world as he would be at the White House. We bring this bubble and we make sure that he's safe. The scope of presidential protection is unlike anything else. But one other person whose protection approaches this level is the presidential candidate. Candidates had always lived outside the bubble until a deadly attack in 1968. American troops and American Marines. June 5th, 1968. Presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy has just pulled off a dramatic primary victory in California. As he leaves the hotel through a jubilant, uncontrolled crowd, a Palestinian student, Sirhan Sirhan, steps forward and fires seven shots at point-blank range. It's the first time in United States history that a presidential candidate is gunned down on the campaign trail. Today, the Secret Service automatically protects the candidate 120 days before the election. 
For candidate John Kerry, it's his first time inside the protective bubble. You don't notice it, except if you have to just walk to the drugstore or go do something totally normal. It's, I guess, just part of the business. It does feel a little bit restrictive, but you know that they're there because it's a dangerous world and they're there to protect you. For the agents, the stark memory of Robert Kennedy's assassination is a constant reminder of the dangers that may lie ahead. I think there's a number of incidents that keep us motivated when we go out on the campaign trail. Going back to President Kennedy's assassination, also uh, the candidate Kennedy's assassination. Those things keep us motivated and uh, keep us on top of our game, even in the uh, long, trying days of, of the campaign. Though the protection isn't quite presidential, it's still intense because the risks are just as high. This is a unique visit uh, today in, in Davenport, Iowa, because the president is visiting here simultaneously with Senator Kerry. What happens when not one, but two Secret Service bubbles hit the same town at once? In Davenport, local authorities were stretched and local bank robbers had a field day, knocking off three banks. The whole point of the campaign for any candidate is to connect with the crowd. The agents have to balance the candidate's desire to be in the crowd with the safety measures needed to keep him alive. During his speech, Kerry appears to be out in the open with no visible barrier, but the platform is surrounded by bulletproof armor. What the crowd sees is a campaign banner. Agents take positions at the sides of the stage and a suburban stands by to whisk Harry away if there's trouble. But the candidate can't worry about trouble. He has to work the crowd, and often the only thing between him and the crowd is the agent. Every protectee is different. They have their own mannerisms and uh, expectations, and uh, we're able to adapt to those and adapt the uh, security uh, methodology around them. In the months leading up to the election, the Secret Service must adapt to Carrie's style. And Carrie must learn to live in the shadow of protection. I spend a lot of time on rope lines. I talk to people. I dive into the crowd. If you want to meet with people and you want to go out and get in a room and have them ask you questions, there's every way in the world to do it. I do it every day. But Carrie is not the only one adapting to full-time security. His family has to adjust too. The whole thing is an intrusion on their lives. It's hard. I mean, we all sat down and I asked them. I didn't do it just, you know, willy-nilly. And uh, there are different attitudes among different members of the family about it. And I think everybody sort of accepted that even though it is an intrusion, they're willing to do it. If the candidate is elected to office, he must take what comes with it. And so does his family. When Dad became president in August, all of a sudden, you know, like, boom, our, our, our life changed overnight. And I remember the first moment uh, the head of my detail came up to me, and um, he came up and he said, listen, I, I know this is a big transformation for you. Uh, we're not here to be your parents. We're not here to tell you what to do, what not to do. Uh, we're here to make sure you don't get kidnapped, um, shot, killed, held for ransom. Mrs. Clinton received numerous death threats. We had some um, person who basically was, I think, stalking um, Chelsea Clinton. These instances were never reported and never talked about, and it, we never wanted, we never let this information out. It was not our job to discuss it. There were special times when the president and Chelsea were together, when it was really important that uh, Chelsea not uh, experience this this very heavy security presence so those times we would give him space they were really good about uh, trying to be flexible sometimes Chelsea and I would walk downtown in Washington and go to a bookstore or something like that but I tried to give them enough notice so that they could prepare I felt that on occasion, giving into the security uh, requirements did isolate me from the public. 
after a man with an assault weapon shot up the White House. The Secret Service asked me to stop running on the mall. So I did, but I hated it. You know, it was my one sort of daily contact with ordinary citizens. There are times when life inside the bubble is claustrophobic. There's not a whole lot of uh, privacy for a president uh, or a first lady. You see them in every situation they're in. You see them when they get up in the morning, when they go to bed at night. You see them when they're happy, you see them when they're sad. So you see them under every situation possible. People say, well, how can you live that way with somebody at your front door all the time? Or you walk out to go for a short walk and there's a Secret Service person. It can be annoying from time to time to have people following you literally every step during the, during the day. Presidents are no different than, than anyone else. They simply need their space, and you try to give them that. They simply need to go out for a run, and you try to give them that opportunity to do that in the most secure environment that you can provide. That's a part that this, I don't think this, a lot of people understand about the Secret Service. We're trying to make these people's lives as normal as we can, even though they are, they are protected on a 24-hour basis. There are only a few rooms in the White House where the president and his family can be truly alone. But so much proximity means very little privacy. The agent must be absolutely trustworthy. Discretion is essential. I don't know about other first families, but I know that Barbara and I talk very frankly in front of them. I always did and always will because we have total trust in their professionalism in their discipline, uh, so that but they, they know a lot of secrets about our own family, personal, intimate stuff about our kids and grandchildren and all of that. The Secret Service is in the front seat of the car when the president's riding with people, talking about anything from national security to sensitive political matters to, you know, personal family matters. What you hear and what you see uh, if they're of a personal nature, if they're of a national security nature, uh, uh, has to stay uh, with you. In 1998, the issue of agent confidentiality was put to the test. Independent counsel Ken Starr subpoenaed several Secret Service agents and officers, including lead agent Larry Cockle, to question him about President Clinton's affair. The Star investigation wanted the agents to testify about personal conversations that they'd overheard. And um, that's, just, that's just not what they would ever do. We internally in the organization uh, didn't want to be perceived as flies on the wall. I've been present when, when sensitive family issues were discussed. And as much as possible, I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to know. I didn't, I felt awkward being present, but I knew my, my presence was compelled by law. The Secret Service contended that requiring testimony from their agents and officers about the very people they protected compromised the essential trust necessary to keep them safe. And we felt very strongly that our agents shouldn't have been uh, summoned. Uh, to testify in that grand jury. We still don't think it's correct. Uh, we argued that all the way to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court ruled that the Secret Service was not immune to subpoena power. And ultimately, Agent Larry Cockle and the others were compelled to testify. It was one of the few times in history that the Secret Service was forced to violate the unwritten code of confidentiality that is their trademark. A difficult job just got tougher. It was a tough time for the Secret Service. We all felt that, uh, that it's awkward to, to uh, compel uh, anyone to, to be subjected to a set of circumstances and then use it against them. I do, sir. Thank you. Thank you. T minus one, 24 hours before the president arrives. More agents and officers stream in for a final Secret Service briefing. The agenda is so sensitive, there's even security screening for the security briefing. 
First, I want to thank Lou Velez. has created a tremendous security plan here. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. It's Friday, May 21st. 9.15 a.m., President Bush arrives at the Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport. The advance team runs through the entire security plan so that every team member knows their role. New threat assessments are reported and potential responses are built into the plan. By game day, the details of the plan will be so ingrained, execution will be second nature. The team appears to have doubled in size again, but the Secret Service will not reveal the size of their force. We've had our people in place here working with the local law enforcement for over a week now. We're finalizing all the details tonight. We're very confident that tomorrow will be a success. Uh, and once we complete tomorrow, we'll go on the road and do it again someplace else. Remarkably, while this Secret Service team advances the LSU event, other teams are advancing five more sites around the country. The president makes hundreds of trips per year. For the Secret Service agent working protection, there is no break. As soon as an agent finishes one advance, they'll go to another. It's not a job for them, it's a way of life for them. It's a lot about being patriotic, and it's a lot about doing the right thing. It's not all 007. Yeah, there's some very difficult times. There's times away from home. There's times that you can't be there for Christmas. There's times that you can't be there for birthdays. Our wives and children would probably say that there's only one family, and that was the Secret Service. At the time, I didn't understand how stressful it was. I would say during the time I was in charge of uh, uh, President Clinton's detail, I can't remember a night that I had more than three hours of continuous sleep. To limit the toll, agents generally work no more than five years on the presidential detail. It takes a great deal of concentration to continue to do what you have to do. But you never know what's around the corner. Everybody burns out. No one maintains an edge constantly. There's a great support network amongst the agents, and I think we all watched each other to ensure that the stress didn't overtake us, that we, we paid attention to friends and colleagues working around us. <laughs> there is a brotherhood among agents. You're bonded to those guys forever. It's uh, one for all and all for one kind of situation. You live together, you eat together, you sleep together, you work side by side. These are people I, I, I literally grew up with. They're like uh, childhood friends, if you will. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. At the same time, I know there's nothing they wouldn't do for me. Agents need that kind of support, especially during presidential campaign season. Campaigns are unpredictable and largely unscripted. Working protection in this environment is one of the most stressful jobs they do. Some of the toughest challenges are unannounced stops, instances where the candidate decides to get off the bus and the schedule and meet the people. On these off-the-record stops known as OTRs, the agents have no choice but to follow the candidate. In a campaign, there's no way of screening every individual that comes out to greet the candidate. When he decides to go out and press the flesh, the agents can't stand in front of him. They have to be to the side, so he's exposed. In August of 2004, candidate Kerry's bus makes several unannounced stops between Davenport, Iowa, and Hannibal, Missouri. With one stop after another, Keeping a constant watch can become mind-numbing. You work around complacency by keeping your focus, you know, keeping your eye on the ball. We trained agents to understand that the things that might seem mundane or routine could very quickly turn to tragic or challenging. You have to maintain that focus, and there can be no distraction. And that all comes down to discipline. We pride ourselves on anticipating potentially anything that could occur and then preparing for it. Hold them on the other side of the question, please. You can't drop your guard. You can't stop looking. Sir, take your hands out of your pockets. At every location, the Secret Service will ask people to show their hands to make sure no weapons are concealed. 
to the agents, even a pen is potentially dangerous. Sir, sir, can you take your hands out of your pocket? Thank you. You, know, you can scan a crowd quite rapidly and, and pick out somebody that's acting strange, dressed differently. You're looking for the unusual. Maybe uh, just, just doing some strange thing that catches your attention. An unannounced stop is still something that is allowed. I don't know how the Secret Service could prevent it. But at that moment, the stress level goes way up. You never know who might be there. You never know what might happen. And you watch them, and they're looking. They're looking at the hands. They're looking through the crowd. Nice to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, your baby. And you just see it in their eyes, and you see it in their body movements. This is a high point of stress. This is the most dangerous point. September 5th, 1975. President Gerald Ford has just finished a speech and is on his way to the California State Capitol building. His motorcade is waiting. But it's a beautiful day. The Capitol building is just across a park, and President Ford spontaneously decides to walk. Agent Larry Bundorf is working on President Ford's protective detail. He walked out of the hotel, and there was a crowd that was across the park at the time that was cheering for him. And he decided to walk. So this creates a lot of tension within the agents themselves because we're now going into an environment that is not controlled. We don't like to do that. You got the media, they're running with their cameras. We're trying to watch the president, watch the crowd. People started shaking hands and, you know, sometimes they hold on too long. And so you're very busy trying to keep the crowd away. And there's so much going on. I'm shaking hands with a lot of people. And I noticed a lady in a very vivid red dress sort of walking with me as I was walking toward the Capitol. And all of a sudden, I went to shake hands. I see a hand coming up with a gun. And I'm thinking at the time, I'm going for this. And I step in front of the president, squeaky from, he was pulling back on the slide. I hit it, stopped the slide, pulled the gun away, pulled it up to my chest. She's screaming, I've got the gun, and I've got her, and I'm not letting go. And so I just push her away from the president, the president's going one direction, I'm going the other direction. And she tries to run and I pulled her back. She goes down the ground, I pull out my cuffs, I cuff her. I yelled out to the agents, the agents covered him. They were gone. How could the agents have predicted that Lynette Squeaky Fromm, a member of the Manson family, would be waiting for the president on a route he wasn't certain to take? What she was doing in the park, who knows? What she's doing with a 45 strapped to her leg, who knows? But she decided at that moment to make a statement. I happened to be looking in the right place at the right time and did the right thing. Agents always have to be alert. They've gotta be watching for that person in the crowd that's acting alone. Larry Bundorf's instincts saved Gerald Ford's life. Do you think back at it? A lot. You do. You think about it a lot. Because you know how close it could have been and how it might have changed history if it hadn't gone down the way it went down. Astonishingly, just 17 days later, it happens again. September 22nd, 1975. White House photographer David Hume Kennerly is waiting with the press pool for President Ford to exit the St. Francis Hotel. I went out and looked at this crowd on the other side of the street, and I just said, I, they, I got such a bad feeling from it, like this sense of dread, really. When President Ford came out of the St. Francis Hotel, I have a picture of him waving to the crowd. And then the shot was fired, and you could see him wincing. I was shot at by Sarah Jane Moore, who was across the street. Thank goodness uh, a Marine standing next to her saw her in the process and hit her hand, and the shot went above me. The 
Secret Service jammed me into the back of the limousine. And they were all kind of laying on top of him as they're driving off back to the airport. After a couple minutes, Ford says, that gunshot didn't get me, but I'm going to be crushed to death under you guys. This is an armor-plated car. Get off of me. With the quick succession of attacks, the Secret Service reflexively tightened their hold. I know that President Ford was really angry about the two attempts on his life. And he was angry that he knew it would, it would further insulate him from, from the public. The Secret Service wanted him to stay in the Oval Office after those incidents. And Dad said, you know, the president cannot be held hostage in the White House. And he made it very clear that after both the Squeaky From and the Sarah Jane Moore situation, he was going to go out and continue to be in the public's eye because he didn't want the American people to think in any way that a president of the United States could be held hostage uh, because of attempted assassination. Game day, T minus five hours before the president lands. At 4 a.m., the Secret Service arrives at the arena. LSU may own the building, but today it belongs to the Secret Service. Basic. Here. Morgan. Here. The team gears up, knowing they have one chance to get it right. Smith. Here. Each agent is wired into a restricted radio network, impervious to eavesdropping and linked to the temporary command center. Wallace, here. Johnson. Here. Every agent will know where the president is at all times. Everybody all set? OK. Game face on, the agents enter the arena. In the next few hours, everything LT's team has prepared for will be put to the test. All right, 212. Home room. Okay, let me make sure I got all these people uh, posted here. Bruce, and you know where you'll be in the security room. You're going to be in a row, man. LT assigns each agent a specific post to guard an entrance, to guard the stage, even to mix into the crowd. At T minus three hours, the Secret Service hold on the arena begins to tighten. Two, three, four, five. They now execute a comprehensive search for bombs and weapons, called a sweep. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. They sweep every plant, every band instrument, and all 14,000 seats. These Belgian Malinois are considered some of the best bomb detectors in the world. Their noses are 20 times more sensitive than ours. As these teams sweep the inside of the arena, other teams check the basement, the roof, and the area under the bleachers. Ready to go. T minus two hours. Once the building is swept, it's sealed off. No one will be allowed in without going through a metal detector first. Magnetometers and several officers guard each of the entrances. Tactical control of the building is theirs for now. At the Baton Rouge airport, it's T minus 90 minutes. The agents are busy taking control of this real estate, too. The president's private fuel supply is standing by. The Secret Service choreographs the movements of the press, the motorcade, well-wishers, and even the president himself. We're all going to come in here. Uh, the press is going to do a free set, get all their equipment swept, and then we're going to get them in one organized group over their designated press a clean area. If any of them go out, it doesn't matter if they've been swept once, you get swept all over again. Over to where the press is. Actually, what people In 90 minutes, the team will shut down all movement on the airport. They call it lockdown. 
Sweeps are underway here, too. The K-9 team checks every vehicle, even the Baton Rouge Police Department motorcycles that'll accompany the motorcade. T-minus 15 minutes until the president arrives. The Secret Service counter sniper team stands ready. At T-minus five minutes, the Baton Rouge airport is temporarily closed. Only Air Force One is clear to approach. On the ground, anything or anyone that moves will get immediate attention from the counter sniper teams. Their measures may seem extreme, but the agents know that history has a violent way of repeating itself. It was a very routine trip from the White House to the Washington Hilton Hotel. The president gave a speech to the building trades union. He left about 2.27 p.m. that day, and we were walking toward the car. When the president came out of the door and started to his limousine, and some of us began to shout at him. Remember the lady behind me saying, Mr. Reagan, Mr. President. Just about six or seven feet from the open door, I heard two quick shots and then four more. The first two shots hit Mr. Brady and Officer Delahanty, and the third one hit McCarthy because we're pushing uh, the president behind McCarthy. McCarthy. He didn't let me down. He stood up there and took it. And as that was happening, another agent literally went right over top of me and my camera, right down onto Hinckley. It was just the amazing thing. Give me a squad park! Go back in the car! What I remember vividly is Parks grabbing the present, taking his head, carefully, quickly putting it down and pushing him into the limo. As we know now, a bullet struck the rim of the door, ricocheted into President Reagan. But at that moment, no one knew that. The door was shut, the feet were thrown in. At that moment, I yelled for the driver to leave quickly. Get out of the way! You don't know whether it's a organized attack. You don't know whether it's a decapitation strike. There's a lot of things you don't know. As the limo speeds toward the White House, Agent Jerry Parr searches President Reagan for gunshot wounds. Everything looks okay until the president starts spitting up bright, frothy blood. In that instant, Parr makes the decision of his life. I knew from my training that this meant some kind of a lung injury, and said, I just said, we gotta take him to the hospital. Parr orders the limo to change direction, and it races toward the hospital. President Reagan walked a few steps in the emergency room and collapsed and almost died. I don't play up myself on this simply because Tim McCarthy made a heroic gesture in st standing up. Everybody shot down and McCarthy is the only one standing up. Agent Tim McCarthy did what every agent hopes he'll never have to do. Using his body as a shield, he turned into the line of fire. He took a bullet for the president. I got to give it to us a brave man to stand there purposely as a body block to protect the President of the United States. When the shots rang out, agents are trained to cover and evacuate. And cover means cover with your own body. It's a counter instinctive movement, it's muscle memory. And it's a moment when you really think about it deeply that it's where history and destiny hang in the balance. where all your training and truth come together in that one moment. Fortunately, no one died that day. The president, Agent McCarthy, and Officer Delahanty all recovered. But Reagan Press Secretary James Brady was severely wounded and permanently disabled. So what did the Secret Service do for Ronald Reagan that day? Well, they didn't prevent John Hinckley from shooting him. The rules were such that civilians, without having been checked by a magnetometer, could be right there on the line, and one of them had a gun. But once the shots came, they performed brilliantly. 
and they saved the president's life. The assassination attempt forced the Secret Service to ratchet up protective measures even more. They plan for the worst and hope for the best. That's what they do every time they take the president out. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Nine fifteen a.m., zero hour. The enormous preparation is over. It's game on. You can think of the Secret Service as a conductor of a large orchestra, but the musicians are made up of the police and fire and emergency uh, uh, medical services. When we met for the first time early this week, it was to announce that we had a performance. We didn't have a musical score. We didn't have a security plan. During this past week, we came up with that composition. Today is the event. electronic devices, bags and purses, please place them here on the table. At the arena, the once-in-a-lifetime day for the graduates and their families begins with a thorough search. Thank you. Officers will screen every one of the thousands of participants. Pagers, keys, cell phones, and electronic devices, please place them on the table. They scan intently for weapons, explosives, even remote control devices. The president exits Air Force One as the security rolls out ahead of him. Secret Service agents and officers are literally everywhere. If they do their job well, the heavy security will feel invisible. The graduation will take center stage. They dress to blend in with the crowd, their suits tailored to conceal the weapon each one carries. The motorcade prepares to pull out. One of these vehicles carries a heavily armed counter-assault team ready to repel any attack. The Secret Service is ready for any threat on the road ahead. Attention all post standards at the Maravitz Assembly Center. We have departure from POTUS to this location. POTUS, shorthand for President of the United States, is T minus 10 minutes away. For LT and his team, this is it. This is the moment they've trained for. Protection is in the details, and everything is rechecked because every agent knows there's always a chance that something could go wrong. The beast arrives, right on schedule to the minute. Supervising agent Tom McCarthy takes his final position on stage. He'll be the agent closest to the president. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States.
Thank you all very much. I want to thank you for the warm welcome. I'm honored to be with you on graduation day. I speak with some authority here. I've seen how things can work out pretty well for a C student. <laughs> While the president gives his speech, the agents live in a parallel world, a world of intense vigilance. Each agent plays a role in securing the 360-degree safety zone. They scan for the individual who does not fit in, who is doing something different. As the president exits the stage, he veers off course and off the plan. It is the one unchoreographed moment of his visit. Then the ranks close and he is in the cocoon again and on his way back to the airport. But for the agents, it still isn't over. On the tarmac, a crowd of 300 wait to see the president off. They look like a spontaneous group, but they are not. They have all been invited and screened. They are temporary guests inside the bubble. One of the things I'm going to do when I pass in front is I'm going to ask you to have your hands up. Just have your hands out here like this, ready to shake the president's hand, OK? That's all I ask. When you stop and think about all the things that have to occur to keep that well-oiled machine running. The responsibility, the dedication, the many sacrifices that people make day in and day out. It's just truly incredible. For the Secret Service, it was a good day. Nothing happened. The average agent is not going to go on to riches and fame and glory having spent a good number of years of their lives putting their life on the line. Their reward is going to be basically the understanding they've done an important job for all of us in this country. They've done the job well. They can be proud of that. We should honor them. But they're not going to get rich. They're not going to be famous. They're just going to be ordinary Americans. The visit has involved thousands of man hours, weeks of coordination, hundreds of people, tons of equipment, and no small amount of stress. The president has been on the ground for 80 minutes. The Secret Service will move on, advancing the next locations, keeping the web of protection spun out ahead of the president so he can keep his public persona, so he can do his job. It was an incredible experience. It was an opportunity, it was an honor. Of all the things that I could have chosen to pursue in my life, I'm glad I had the opportunity to serve in the Secret Service. The things that I've witnessed as a part of history have been incredible. I wouldn't change it, I'd do it again.